And I said, I want a ticket to go in uh, to the movie. He said, you know you can't go in this movie. And that time there were about three men around me. So, I mean, I never did get afraid. I said, well, will you please, uh, wasn't this stupid, take these keys into Mrs. Rollins. She just went in there. Well, most people knew her. Mm -hmm. I said, and uh, tell her that I'm around to my cousin. I'll walk around to a cousin's house about two blocks away to this parsonage. And he said, I'm not going to take the keys. I'll go and tell her. So sure enough, uh, Miss Rollins came, came in out. And she said, why don't you come on in, Idella? Push me like this. I said, OK. She said, get in there. And so she headed out with the men. And of course, they let her, let me go in. I went in, sat beside her. Mm -hmm. But if you would ask me right now, what was the movie about, I couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell. I was too afraid. <laughs> Hello, this is Worth Quoting, a program produced by Florida Community College at Jacksonville's Women's Center. I'm Edith Abdullah. I'm glad to have you with us today, and I'd like to introduce you to an interesting woman. Her name is Idella Parker, and Idella is in the middle of writing a book about her experiences growing up in, in Florida and her special and unique relationship with Marjorie Kennan Rawlins, um, an author of world renown. She wrote The Yearling and Cross Creek. Idella right now is writing a book of her own, and it's called Idella, Marjorie Kennan Rawlins, Perfect Maid. Welcome, Idella. Thank you so much for the introduction. And you said, Idella, Marjorie Kennan Rawlins, Perfect Maid. That is what uh, Mrs. Rollins said. She said that I was her perfect maid. I think she said that uh, because after talking with her about her various helpers, she said that she couldn't write because of the interruptions of the, the maids or the yard men. And I would be in quiet and letting her work. And she just thought I could cook. She found out I could cook as well as she could. I kept her house. So she said, this, the Lord sent me, you to me. <laughs> You're my perfect maid. So I said, why not use it as my title, Idella Marjorie Kennan Rawlins, Perfect Maid. Well, that's and wonderful. <laughs> how, did, how did you decide to write this book? I decided. I really didn't decide. Others decided for me. Hmm. After Mrs. Rollins' death and my husband's death, I went to Broward County, and I rent was renting a house. And this lady came over for her rent one morning, and as per usual, I said, "Have a piece of cake." And she said, "Certainly." So finally, she said, "Is this cake from scratch?" And I said, "Everything I do is from scratch, like this." And then we went on to talk, and then she said wondered if she could use, I showed them a cookbook mm -hmm. and uh, autograph from Mrs. Rawlins and my recipes. And she said, Miss Parker, may I wonder if I could borrow it, your book? I said, I don't loan my book <laughs> like this. So later she said, uh, I wish you had a certificate. I would, could use you in my homemaking program. And I said, I do have a certificate like this. And she said, you do? Well, anyway, it went on. and. Uh, that was your your certificate to teach? To teach. I carried it with me always. And I had taught in uh, Marion County, uh, Levy County, and Polk County mm -hmm. beforehand. And so I care. I keep my things with me. Just happened I had she let me have it. And next thing I knew, she was em had employed me, had me sign up to go to work at Broward County School Board. Wonderful. And that's where I retired from. And she was one of the first people to also encourage one, you yes. to... She asked me why not put down. And then one day doing, after I was teaching, uh, working with EMRs at this center. 
teaching homemaking and interviewing and what have you. Um, and this um, reporter from Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale, this lady came out and after talking, she said, Miss Parker, why don't you write, sit down and write and tell about your life in this? Well, I thought nothing of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And later then I met Sally Morrison out at Cross Creek. Mm -hmm. And she continually worried me about putting down my memories. So you were, you had spent a lot of time then telling stories about things that happened yes. to you and Marjorie and... Thinking nothing of it. <laughs> yeah. And um, Sally, of course, encouraged me and she talked and Mr. Mays was another. He said, why don't you? And he went out and got somebody to write the book for me. Well, anyway, I didn't use that person. Mm -hmm. But he said, Idella, at one of the meetings, Idella has someone who will do it for you. I was begging for someone to, to write the story. Then it came to me, I didn't need a writer. I need someone to, to just correct, you know, to reread, because I have written my, have it all over everywhere. I've written and made notes all through the years, so it just was a matter of getting it together. Mm -hmm. And this year, I mean last year, there came a lady from the time that I met, you know, was at Reddick, mm -hmm. name. and she came and asked me if I would let her help me or do the story for me. And I said, no, I'm not interested. Because you wanted to write it yourself. <laughs> yes. Well, after living all those years and working <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for and with an author, you mm -hmm. must have picked up some, some points on, on what it takes to write a, a novel or to write a story. Yes, uh, Mrs. Rawlins, being around her, of course, I never read her work. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a no-no. I don't care how bad, I mean, they, yellow sheets was balled up on the floor, leave it, you know, because probably she would reread, say, don't bother these. But I could see, and she would write about, and especially Cross Creek, about the people. And I said, well, the working for Mrs. Rollins, and there are other points in my life that I thought was really interesting, mm -hmm. because you think, take uh, uh, the slave, who the people always talk about, Nat Turner. Well, Nat Turner, my daddy came down the line from Nat Turner. My wow. great granddaddy, uh, uncle, was Adam Turner, the brother of Nat Turner. And I just thought my life and Marjorie Rollins' life, and I'd like to make this point, because this is a little in my book. I said, Mrs. Rollins was looking for one thing. I was looking for, we were looking for the same thing. Mm -hmm. She didn't have a husband, I didn't have a husband. Both of us were looking for husbands. Oh, cut. <laughs> <laughs> but you found each other. We found each other, and then she found a husband, and I found a husband. Well, that was perfect timing. <laughs> that was. was perfect timing. Mm -hmm. So as the perfect maid for mm -hmm. Marjorie Kenan Rawlins, mm -hmm. how, did that, how was your relationship? What was unique about that relationship that would be different from a, another employer-employee relationship? I'm glad you asked that, because uh, with Mrs. Rawlins, I didn't feel like I was a maid, although I was a maid. Uh, we were close together. She could sit down and talk with me. Mm -hmm. And of course, I didn't have too much to tell her, but she would tell me and I would, I would feel real sorry for her many times, you know, because her, she would tell the stories of her father, her love for her father. She didn't mention mommy that much, but her, and she had one brother mm -hmm. who was in Alaska. And they didn't visit too much. I think during the 13 years I was there, I saw him twice. And uh, it seemed that she could lean on me. She could talk to me. As I said, she and Mr. Baskin wasn't married at the time. And that made me come closer to her because I felt that she, I could help her because when she would get depressed, uh, I would look at her face, I could tell her what's the matter. Mm. Nothing, nothing. Sometimes she'd cry, she would tell me, you know. So then we just, she loved me and I loved her and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you always get along? Was it always the perfect relationship? Well, I would say yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> because she had her, after all, she was human and I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, she would have her days, you know, things would worry her and she would yell. She liked to stomp and yell. And uh, I guess, uh, 
because of the love for her. And then many people, especially my people, they don't understand how I can say I loved her. But I do. I still love her, you know. And uh, about two weeks before her death, I remember, she wrote me, see, I left her. And uh, she asked me if I would meet her at Cross Creek and let's straighten things out. Mm. But before the two weeks, she, was, she died that Friday, see. So um, that's it. Was was that hard for you yeah. in the in the thirties and the forties and the fifties to to have a relationship with a white woman like that um, when so many black people African Americans were dissatisfied with jobs environment mm -hmm. society mm -hmm. was that difficult? It was. Let me tell her say it like this: working for Mrs. Rollins, and as I say, we went all over. We went many places and I told you and I'm sure that those who know Miss Rollins know that she did drink and, and she would by two o'clock any day she had had far more than she should have had. See, and she about to do with her day's work though. And uh, we would ride. I'll tell you this little story. One afternoon around 2.30 she said to me, Adela get your dress on let's go into O'Kella to a movie. I don't know if you know it, maybe you don't know it, see, because it's long before you were born. Um, she said for me to come in and let's go to the movie. There wasn't any point in arguing with her. So I said, uh, well, I'll drive, see. She let me drive. We went in to Ocala, got in front of the, this new theater. Mm -hmm. And she said, just put me out here and go and park the car and come on. Miss Rollins, I can't go. Go and park. She went in. I parked the car and I went up to the um, ticket office. And as I walked up there, two thirty in the day. Now you just picture this because I knew that we were supposed to go in after six o'clock. It had to be dark, and we go around and go upstairs in the balcony. Mm -hmm. But she told me to come. I always obeyed her. <laughs> That was she, the boss. <laughs> she, that was the boss. And she said, come in. So I went up there, and these, and he called me the same. And you know, right now, I'm going to say, and I'm so happy to, when I look in the mirror at myself, and I think of the many years that I've spent in this life, and I can say, at first, people called me nigger. Mm. And then they called Negro. And then again, we called me colored. And then they said black, and now Afro-American. You know, I said, and I still can smile. That's, so in my book, I said, wonder what's next? The next 20 years, I don't know what my name will be. <laughs> <laughs> but let me finish telling mm -hmm. you about this uh, um, movie. I went there, and this, this one man said, well, you go, what you want, nigga, mm -hmm. like this? And I said, I want a ticket to go in uh, to the movie. He said, you know you can't go in this movie. And that time there were about three men around me. So, I mean, I never did get afraid. I said, well, will you please, uh, wasn't this stupid, take these keys into Mrs. Rollins. She just went in there. Well, most people knew her. Mm -hmm. I said, and uh, tell her that I'm around to my cousin. I'll walk around to a cousin's house about two blocks away to this parsonage. And he said, I'm not going to take the keys. I'll go and tell her. So sure enough, uh, Miss Rollins came, came in out. And she said, why don't you come on in, Idella? Push me like this. I said, OK. She said, get in there. And so she headed out with the men. And of course, they let, her, let me go in. I went in, sat beside her. Mm -hmm. But if you would ask me right now, what was the movie about, I couldn't tell you. You couldn't tell. I was too afraid. <laughs> That's it. Tell me a little bit about Cross Creek, um, the house and the land and the community. Is can you describe that for us and, the house and whether it's the, changed much? The house is now as it was then. They haven't changed the house at all. Mm -hmm. Of course, little repairs have been made, but the house is the same. And uh, the community, of course, was nothing but woods. And the, her house, coming from the south, was the very first house. Um, then there were four other families out there. One was a poor, poor family, and they lived what we called around the bend. But these other people and were there. And 
after being out there a long time, I said, now it's not slavery, but it must be a plantation hmm. because we were five miles out from any place. Island Grove was the closest place. And uh, the woods, there were woods and snakes mm -hmm. everywhere. How far was Hawthorne at that time? Oh, Hawthorne is still, Hawthorne is about 14, 15 miles, miles. but you had to, to leave Mrs. Rollins' house. We had to go with the five miles south to Island Grove and go back down to Hawthorne. Mm -hmm. Or you go toward Gainesville and catch 20, which is a longer way mm -hmm. around. It was no short distance any, to any place. Is it still the same quiet environment and, and off the beaten path as it was? Well, the house is because, um, I mean, out in Cross Creek, mm -hmm. the Mrs. Rollins' house is the same quiet place with the help as the same because all the while I was there, there were five of us out there. Mm -hmm. She had this one white woman had the five blacks working for her. That's why I said it was a plantation. And was there was no way in the world for us to get away from there unless she carried us or we used her um, car or truck, see? So, so you, I said, it's a plantation, goodness, you know. You were enslaved by, <laughs> by proximity, <laughs> yeah. Oh dear, but it's a, there's a change now because I went to that, I think, 76, I retired from Broward County mm -hmm. and a group of uh, homemakers asked me from the extension department if I would give them a tour out there and I went. And I was amazed at the, well, there was a firehouse, there was a church build, and, and the park was there. See, the park was our, where the park is, that was the pasture, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, there was a, coming from Orange Lake, there's waterway down there, and all of that was fields, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and then we went around the bend, there was a restaurant, and, and beautiful, a lovely house there on the curb. There wasn't anything, but Mr. Bryce had the two-story house and Mrs. Rollins, so. It's changed just it's a It's changed a lot. It's changed to me a lot. Okay. Someone said not much, but I said a lot because there wasn't anything out there. Well, how about the environment for African Americans? Has, has that and the attitude toward African Americans, a has change, that changed I much? should say it has changed all over the world, yes. you know. And uh, I go out there now and I mean, where years ago in, in the 30s, 40s, or 50s, mm -hmm. see, um, people always, they would refer to me as, uh, that's uh, Marge's, Marge's Idella, mm -hmm. or there's Marge's girl, or something like that. Because of her name, you know, I think it protected me. And uh, I went out to the restaurant, carried a group of people, and mm -hmm. They were all over me, you know, Idella, Idella, and some knew me, you know, there are one or two old people out there, but most you. of them are knew it, but all I have to do is say, I'm Idella who used to work for me. Oh, yes, you know, so it has changed That's in wonderful. many ways, it That's is. That's wonderful. Now, before you went to work for Marjorie, mm -hmm. you were a teacher. Mm -hmm. You taught in, in, in the school system, is that yeah, right? right. What made you change from teaching <laughs> to being a maid? One thing that changed me from, gave me the idea. I had some friends in West Palm Beach, and of course it seems like uh, they were really enjoying life. And to be a teacher, it wasn't as you all are now. See, it was so different, especially in Marin County. Um, they had, there were these men would ride on horsebacks, you know, and they would come around to see what the teachers were doing. Not that they were educated or anything, mm -hmm. but they would just had that attitude that I'm over you, you know, you do what I say. And of course, uh, they would tell us where to go. I heard you went to the dance the other night. You can't teach out here if you're going to a dance. And I said, well, 15 years old, I know he didn't talk to me, so I must do something else. And I went to West Palm Beach and found me a job with a lovely couple. Mm -hmm. And this couple is who I worked for until I uh, left them at five years and came. That was in 37, the beginning of 37. And I went and 
outside work for Mrs. Wallens. Hmm. Did the fact that you were an, an educated person, a teacher, mm -hmm. positively affect your relationship with Ms. Rawlings? No, you know, Ms. Rawlings didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Our interview was, she said, uh, I heard you were looking for a cook job. Can you cook? I'm talking as, can you cook? Oh, yes, ma'am, I'm a cook. I'm a good cook. She says, started writing a check. That's all the she that's all she <laughs> asked about me, could I cook, you know. And uh, she didn't know, I didn't tell her, and she didn't know it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't, it didn't, affect, didn't it. affect her at all. But it, it the, affected her positively enough for her to include your recipes in, in one of her <laughs> books. Yes, well, that was after being there a couple of years, say that um, uh, she wrote that book after she hadn't completed Cross Creek. Mm -hmm. the novel when I got there and then after the novel and after the um, yearling was made into a movie see all of this and by and by one day she says I know let's make a cookbook you see and but I didn't tell her but this day that uh, she came in the room and I was reading one of her books I was cleaning the shelf and I was reading and she said good morning and of course I jumped because I she caught me reading and not doing my work mm -hmm. that's what I thought and she said oh do you like to read and this is I think but because I don't know about the many of them out there couldn't even read see mm -hmm. and I say many they couldn't read out there because if you note in the Cross Creek Cookery, where she said what Marge, Martha said when she told her the Lord had sent me to her. And she came in one day stumping and she said, Adele, don't you ever, don't you ever read this to Martha? <laughs> or what she said about me. <laughs> she said, they couldn't read, see, and she was surprised, I guess, to find someone working as a maid and could read could because read. they, most black people with maid jobs just didn't read, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, if they were educated, they didn't take a maid's job. But I took mine and I enjoyed it, one thing, because I could drive her car she, after she found I could drive and go in the various places out of state and in state. Well, that was really educational to me and I, I enjoyed it. Were there many other maids in the, in the area that no. were not all? I was the only maid. Those other people out there didn't have help. They didn't have help. And when we went over to the cottage in St. Augustine, there was a girl from Hastings. Well, everywhere I went, I was secluded. Come to think of it, I was just like this. In St. Augustine, uh, which is about 20 miles south uh, at Crescent Beach, that's where the cottage was. There was no boy out there but me. And then when we went to Van Hornsville, up in the mountains, there was nobody but me. Mm. <laughs> so we were just there, mm. the two of us together. Mm -hmm. But um, but you, as even as a maid, you had many wonderful experiences and met presidents' wives and, and other great people. Tell us a little bit about some of the, then, the folks that you met while working for Miss Rawlings. Well, I'll tell you about some of them. Um, one person that I admired and enjoyed talking, and I did serve her, um, Marcia Davenport. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Margie Mitchell, who wrote Gone with the Wind. She was an orphan visitor. And uh, Gregory Peck. Um, Um, Houston, She's, this is a black author that I'm talking about. Zora, Zora Neale Houston? Zora Neale, mm -hmm. and uh, nice looking lady. But uh, she came, would come out often. She came out, I say often, as a writer. And they would work together out there on the porch, she and Mrs. Rollins. So Marjorie would work with a black author. In those days, in those which days. was so unusual. Yes. See? It was bad enough for her taking me to Ocala and making me go in the white side of a theater. And then for her to have this black woman come from Orlando's side, a popker, 
to work with her and they would drink together and they mm. would laugh and they would talk they would get real loud real loud <laughs> and I would serve them lunch and they and then one night once she came out and I don't know what happened but Zora couldn't go home that night so Mrs. Rollins yelled for me to come up to the house mm -hmm. went there she said now Adela Zora will sleep with you tonight that's all she said Zora will sleep with you with you so when Zora got ready to go home it had turned cool. It was in October. You know how you go to bed one night and you wake up, it's cold. Mm -hmm. And I had a beautiful um, quilt my mother gave me, but it wasn't a heavy quilt, see. She said, I know I'll take this around me and I'll bring it back. But Zora never did return my quilt. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it was in those days. She could work with Mrs. Rollins. She could talk. And I did serve them not a big dinner. It was sandwiches on the at the round table on the porch. Mm -hmm. They ate, but she couldn't stay in the house with her. Once upon a time, I was talking, and a lady held her hand up for questioning, and she wanted to know from me. Said, "You said Miss Rollins was so nice, and how she what she thought about the blacks and white. Why did she?" Uh, why didn't she let you stay in the house with her? See, where she went, she built me a little house on the outside. And so my answer was to this person. I said, put yourself in her place when? In 1937 or 40. And she laughed, and that's it. Yes. She couldn't do it, see, because of the, the laws or what have you, of the races then, the difference between the races. Mm. Now I'm through. Miss um, Miss Rollins encouraged you a lot to take up skills and and even to do um, cosmetology. Is that right? I'll tell you, uh, Mrs. Rollins. We were riding along from Cross Creek to St. Augustine to the cottage one day, and I had to, to serve a lunch over there after cleaning up the kitchen and what have you at Cross Creek and. All of a sudden, she said, Idella, is there anything you would like to do after I'm dead? Anything you'd like to take up? Is it a course or whatever? And I said, after you're dead, all this work I'm doing, I said, anyway, I didn't say any more than that. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm not kidding, anything. So we got almost to the bridge, and I said, I know. I said, I've always wanted to be a hairdresser. That's what I said, a hairdresser. And she said, where do you go? And I said, there's a school in Atlanta, not thinking anything that she would ever send me. Mm -hmm. And about two weeks, and not more than three weeks after that, I had all the material, everything, get ready, get ready to go to Atlanta. So I went to Atlanta. And she had found that uh, the manager told me that in the evenings I would have to work longer than the other students because I had white hair to do. Ms. Parker, yeah. it was wonderful talking to you, <laughs> it was good talking. and um, I'm glad after many, many years of, of helping Ms. Rollins, you now mm -hmm. have your opportunity to write a book of your own, mm -hmm. and congratulations and, and good luck and God bless on, on your efforts to finish your book and get it published, and I want to thank you for being with us today on Worth Quoting.